Welcome back, I'm Dr. Dai, and we're going to dig into glycolysis in this video. But first, before we can really start talking about glycolysis, we have to talk about a very special molecule, ATP. All right, quick refresher. So hopefully you remember from the last video that exergonic reactions, um, those are the ones where we have more potential energy in the reactant than in the final product. These reactions, while considered spontaneous because they release energy, they still require a small amount of activation energy, that little kick to get going. Um, and then on the other hand, we have our endergonic reactions that demand energy, um, a more substantial amount of energy input in order to create its products. Um, so how do we do this? Where does that energy come from? Right, because we can't just create it. It's gotta come from somewhere. And the answer to that is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Um, it has a great amount of potential energy stored in its phosphate bonds. Um, and it's gonna serve as the primary cellular energy currency. You can think of it kind of like how we use money to exchange goods. Um, it fuels the majority of energy demanding cellular processes. All right. This is really important. Living cells cannot store a significant amount of free energy because the excess heat from that free energy would raise the cell's temperature. That would lead to denaturation of the proteins. That means unfolding, the proteins unfolding, and then they don't work. Um, it also would change the um, integrity of the cell's membrane if they were too warm, cause them to melt. So we can't have a bunch of free energy laying around. So what does your cell do? It uses ATP as a rechargeable energy source. Um, it can store and release energy readily. So when ATP is broken down, typically by removing its terminal phosphate group, so from ATP, a adenosine triphosphate, to adenosine diphosphate, D, um, that's going to release, release energy. Um, you can also go from ADP to AMP, so from two to just one, um, but that doesn't release quite as much energy. Um, it's, little, it's used for different things. Um, okay, so when ATP is broken down, we're typically going to remove that last phosphate group and it's going to release energy when it happens. Uh, this energy powers cellular work, often by activating other molecules through something called phosphate binding or phosphorylation. It's another word we use for that. Um, so for instance, during muscle contraction, ATP provides the energy needed to move the contractile muscle proteins. Uh, all these vast array of proteins and they have to have ATP in order to do their work. It looks like a little arm flexing. So ATP centers around this, this the base of its molecule, this adenosine monophosphate, AMP. Uh, it consists of an adenine, a ribose, sugar, and a single phosphate group. Adding another phosphate group yields adenosine diphosphate, ADP, and the third phosphate group is going to form adenosine triphosphate, ATP. So the addition of a phosphate group demands a substantial amount of energy and results in this higher energy bond. So we have to feed a bunch of energy in in order to create the ATP molecule, which then can be used to feed energy into a different system. Um, the phosphate group carries a negative charge, uh, and this causes it to be repulsed uh, when arranged in a series as seen in ADP. It's how we get that little chain that sticks out. Um, it's inherently unstable, um, both ADP and ATP. They are unstable and readily available to release energy through hydrolysis. Um, so that's going to involve the removal of one or two of those phosphate groups. Most living organisms are going to rely on glycolysis as the initial step in breaking down glucose to access energy for cellular metabolism. Well, why is that important? We got to make that ATP, right? We got to be able to recharge those ATP molecules. So glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Um, and it begins with a six carbon glucose molecule and culminates in two three carbon pyruvate molecules. Um, this process consists of two phases. The first involves energy consumption adjustments to split that six carbon sugar, um, while the second is going to generate ATP and uh, an NADH, a nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. 
in ADH, <laughs> easier to remember. Um, in cases where further catabolism, right, so further breaking down of pyruvate is possible, um, only two ATP molecules are produced from one glucose molecule. Um, for instance, mature mammalian red blood cells uh, rely heavily on glycolysis for ATP production. Um, it's their primary energy source. So disruption of glycolysis in a red blood cell uh, leads to its eventual death. And you might be thinking, wait, a mammalian red blood cell, where's their mitochondria? Mature red blood cells do not have mitochondria. It's part, part of what gives them that unique uh, kind of disced in shape. They don't have a whole lot going on inside of them. They've got glycolysis and a few other primary processes that are happening. Uh, yeah, no, no mitochondria, so no oxidative phosphorylation. We'll talk about that more later. All right. Thank you for joining me on our quick discussion of ATP and glycolysis. And I'll see you next time where we'll get into the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation.